Good afternoon. This is March the 8th, 1999 in Natick, Massachusetts. This is part of the Morse Institute Library Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. And what is your name, sir? Well, I'm known as Manny Abrams, really Emmanuel Abrams in the military records, I guess, but Manny Abrams. And where, what is Natick? And your marital status? I am married. I have two children, both grown daughters. One is now almost 39 in a few days, and the other one is 41. <laughs> Married. May I ask you your age? Sure. 75 just became that on February 27th. Happy birthday. Thank you very much. <laughs> and you say you have two children. Any yeah. grandchildren yet? Yes, three grandchildren, and I'm about to be a fourth one in around another four months or so. Very good for you, sir. Distant grandchild. That would be in Arizona. Another one. I have two in Arizona and two in Rhode Island. Oh, I hope you get to see them often. Yes. Where were you born, Manny? I was born in Brookline, actually Boston, in a hospital that is now extinct, no longer surviving on the Charles River, and uh, grew up in Brookline. And where, were you raised there, or when did you come to yes. Natick? I moved to Natick in 1956, after I was married, uh, before we had children. Uh, I was the general manager of a specialty nail company out in Framingham, which caused the move. We were living in Jamaica Plain at that time. So you really didn't actually grow up in Natick, but what was it like in 1956? Natick? Yeah. Well, I remember uh, the giant intersection of uh, Speen Street and Route 9 uh, that we now have was nothing like that. It was a nice, quiet intersection, and there was a there was an antique shop, I think, on one corner. Uh, there's nothing now except a giant whirligig of concrete. And Route 9 was totally passable, even at Christmas time or Easter. You could drive up and down Route 9 with no concerns about heavy traffic. Didn't have to think about what time of day it was. It was just a much smaller community. You could probably make a left turn in those days. <laughs> yes, you could, actually, so, yeah. Okay. What is your family background, Manny? Well, let's see. Uh, my father was a, a rabbi. He was a reform rabbi in Brookline of a, a large temple, Ohabai Shalom on Beacon Street, which is a prominent uh, institution there. Uh, he was that from 1921 until virtually he died in 1951. He was only 60 when he died. But anyway, that was his position. And uh, I, I have two brothers and one sister. And uh, we were all sort of brought up as, you know, we had to be look correct to the community because we were the rabbi's children, just like being the minister's sons and all of that, I guess. Yes. And, um, you know, that was sort of a strong influence, I think, on all of us growing up. I have two brothers. Uh, my older brother is Dave. He just became 80. Well, he's almost going to be 81 in April, so he just didn't become. And the younger brother, Bob who is two years younger than I am. He'll be 73 in uh, another few weeks. So you moved to Natick after you had been in the service? No. I moved to Natick in nine... Oh, yes. I, I'm sorry. Yeah. After, I, after, after that, mm -hmm. 11 years later. Uh, when and where did you enter uh, the military? Uh, let's see. I think I entered... Uh, I signed up in advance, possibly at... Um, on Commonwealth Avenue at, um, there was some kind of a military depot there, I've forgotten what it was called, but anyway, my first actual place that I went to was I took the train from Boston to Fort Devens, where I was uh, ordered to report for duty on early, in early April 43. And I had signed up in the, at that time, the U.S. Army Air Corps. It was not yet the Air Forces, USAAF. It became that later on. And uh, I don't remember much of what happened to me at Devon's. Uh, the next thing that I know happened in my career was I was shipped down by train to Nashville, Tennessee, to uh, an Air Force uh, allocation center or whatever, where the, first of all, we, we were tested to see if we qualified uh, for flying crew. I, f I signed up for flight crew. I wanted to be mm -hmm. uh, a navigator is what I wanted to be. You, you had several choices when you went into Boston that day. Uh, three or four of them. Why Perhaps did you pick did. the Air Force? I don't know that I had several choices. I, I wanted to be in the Air Force because that's, there was act, action and I was, uh, ah, I was anxious to see the war won and wanted to get on with it. And uh, 
maybe it was uh, newspaper advertisements or whatever. I don't know. I just felt the idea of the Air Force was better than uh, being in the infantry or the artillery or some other ground position. You'd rather fly than walk yeah. across Europe. Of course, you have to remember that at that time I, I was immortal, as were all my friends. We had this feeling of immortality, I think, about us. Even at the most dire time, as I would get to later on, I, I, although I wasn't thinking immortality at the moment, I felt immediately following such uh, uh, horrible emotional exertions, I'm immortal. You know, I mean, that wasn't foremost in my mind, but I'm not going to get killed. Mm -hmm. So after you joined, uh, and your very basic training was where? Well, let's see. I went to Nashville. I was tested to see if I qualified for pilot, bombardier, or navigator. I qualified for all three. Uh, they gave me my choice. I said, I want to be a navigator. That's why I came into this thing. And they said, oops, sorry, all navigation schools are full. If you want to go to pilot training, you can do that. And um, being the great hero that I was, I said, sure, I'll go to pilot training. I didn't want to be a pilot, but I did go to pilot training. So I said, yes. Next thing that happened to me was I was sent down to uh, Maxwell Field in Montgomery, Alabama for pre-flight training. I don't know what the pre-flight really meant. It meant a lot of physical exertion, running uh, what they call it, the Burma Road in the woods there, uh, obstacle courses, all kinds of things. That was a two-month uh, stint at Maxwell Field. Were you alone, Manny? Uh, that is to say, when you <clears throat> left to join the military, did anyone from your hometown go with you? I don't think any, I knew, I knew nobody. Uh, if they did go with me, I didn't know them before that. Is there time. anybody who uh, very early on uh, became part of you, that well, is to say, later a on buddy? I got to be friendly with uh, yeah. uh, another, another boy. But anyway, after Maxwell Field, I think I then w was shipped to uh, somewhere along the way here. I went to aerial gunnery school also in uh, Fort Myers, Florida. I think maybe that was right after, right after the uh, Burm uh, Montgomery, Alabama. And um, it was useful, I guess. I mean, I learned how to, uh, how to fire a 50 caliber machine gun. Actually, we were taught how to blindfold strip a, B, uh, a 50 caliber machine gun and put it together blindfolded. That was never called upon as an action on my part, but you know, okay, we learned how to do that. And uh, we just learned how to use a 50 caliber machine gun. And so we that's, that's two skills the, the Air Force thought they would try you out on. You, they asked you if you'd like to be a pilot, oh, and yes, then an okay. aerial gunner. Yes. And you're leading up to something else, uh, I yeah. think. Then I was sent off to pilot training. And I, this one was primary flying school at, at Clarksdale, Mississippi. That was my first major taste of the Deep South Clarksdale. That's right in the, in the Cotton Belt. And it was Old South, and uh, I mean, it was a town with one two-story, maybe, or three-story, maybe, wooden hotel in it. Uh, it was a nothing. <laughs> anyway, I was stationed there, and I had around three different civilian flight instructors. We were, we were taught to fly Stearman's PT, uh, a biplane, a, bi a bi-wing plane, two wings. Anyway. I was not very happy with the spinning and the stalling that I had to go through in order to, uh, to qualify to, to do my solo. And I remember finally my uh, instructor got behind the tee on a field and he said, OK, solo. This was after, I think, 11 hours. And I took off and I got up to 500 feet as I was supposed to and I circled the field. I wasn't a happy camper all by myself, but anyway, uh, I came down to land. I was correcting for the wind crabbing into the wind a bit, and I didn't uncrab quick enough, and I went into a ground loop ultimately and broke the bottom wing. Would These you describe a ground loop, please? Oh, the, the whole plane just goes around, <laughs> tilted onto that wing rather than uh, on two wheels. Anyway, they, they agreed with me that I would be a happier navigator, and now navigation school was open, so uh, that was the end of my flying experiences, I'm glad to say. I would not have enjoyed being a pilot, I don't think. So I was, uh, the next thing, I, I was assigned to Selman Field in Monroe, Louisiana. Uh, that was a, a most interesting experience. I think that was navigation school, finally. <clears throat> uh, I think it was three months long, and it was fairly intensive. There was no time wasted. Uh, we learned everything we had to learn about navigation. 
including Celestial, and I was an excellent Celestial navigator, so naturally, ultimately, I was sent to where you don't use Celestial. But anyway. Could you tell us a little bit about that? What is Celestial navigation? Celestial is uh, being able to recognize certain key stars at night. You have to have the visibility of stars, first of all, uh, with an octant. I don't know what the difference between a sextant and an octant is, but we had a, an aviation was an octant. Uh, you take some shots, uh, multiple shots on the particular stars you have in mind. You have to identify them, of course, and know which ones you want. And from that, you go into certain reference book uh, reference books that we had with us that would tell you exactly how to draw a line on your map. I mean, at what angle and so forth. And presumably, there would be at least two, maybe three lines when you drew them from different stars that you shot and you would have a perfect fix of that's where you were when you last shot uh, the three stars. I mean, you know. anyway, it gave you your location. Okay, but involved. you had three months of training to be a navigator. Yes. Did, were you and alone was again, or, or you, did you begin to pick up a unit or any sense of being Not, in a unit? Um, yeah, well, I mean, we did have a lot of camaraderie. I don't think there was much time to go running around, or nor did we want to. We really wanted to get ahead with learning navigation. Uh, I had friends there, certainly in the barracks in which I was assigned. I have pictures of some of them at home and I can even remember their names, but as happens after navigation school, everybody goes in different directions, assigned to different uh, follow-on mm -hmm. flying careers. Were you flying at this time? And we what were, kind of we planes were you in? Flying. Uh, we would, uh, let me see, what was it called? I think a uh, Constellation was it? It was a small two-engine plane with around uh, room for maybe 10 passengers in it, which were navigation training uh, flight planes. Mm -hmm. Pilot and the co-pilot, I think. And they would do what they were supposed to do, and we would do our navigation. That's where we learned aerial navigation uh, in the air. And when it came to doing celestial, they would, I remember, hang heavy curtains on the windows. You wouldn't be able to see outside of the plane when you were in it. And you navigated from your instruments and from taking celestial shots. I was very good at Celestial, too. So you, you were out at night in a plane with the shades down? Out at night with the shades down. I did have a friend, I remember, there, uh, when I was there, who went on leave with me at some point. We went back, came back home, and I think he lived in Melrose, uh, Vincent Nogla, and uh, he and I went back, when we traveled back together after our leaves were over, I remember staying overnight in uh, Vicksburg, Mississippi, with a ceiling fan going around, really old south. And shortly thereafter, I, he wasn't in my barracks, but we went on without finishing our navigation training, and uh, I heard that he was killed in navigation training, a crash of a training plane. It happens. So that was, my, that was the first person I knew that, that uh, lost their life that I was mm -hmm. with. Was there such a thing as graduating from navigation school? You got wings? Yes, that's uh, where we graduated. I graduated on March 4th, 1944, I think. Class of 44-4 from Selman. And we got our wings and we got our second lieutenant's bars at the same time. And I think we also got a, a, a certificate saying we were now in the USAAF rather than U.S. Army Air Corps. They changed it over at mm -hmm. that time. and. Uh, I, when I, before the war started, I had been a camper up in Vermont at a summer camp, and I knew uh, another boy up there named Stanley Russell, and our whole lives from that moment from summer camp in the 30s right through the war, we seemed to continue to meet each other and, you know, uh, to become friends again. And the second time I saw him since, uh, since we were together at summer camp was at Selman Field. And he had married one of the girls named Enid, uh, Enid Asnes from the girls' camp. Anyway, there they were marching right down the street, and we met again in Selman. Anyway, I didn't have anything further to do with him. Uh, we all went our separate ways. And after Selman, I was uh, ordered to go to uh, Casper, Wyoming. I still had not had a crew. I had no further assignments, except I was a navigator with wings and second lieutenant bars. And it was time to get on. And uh, I was sent out to Casper, Wyoming, which I knew before I got there. I don't know how I got there. But anyway, I knew it was a B-24 only uh, assembly point where crews for B-24s were put together. And that's what happened. So I got to Casper, Wyoming. That would be probably uh, the month of April, at least, 
1944, I was at Casper, Wyoming. And um, our whole crew was put together. I could show a picture, if that's all right, right now. Um, I don't know if this was taken there, but at any rate, this is this was the final crew that I flew with. Uh, I think I'm recognizable as being the only one with the with the other other than the uh, mufti cap on or something. I have uh, here in the uh, back row on the right hand side. There is that correct? Right there. Okay. Yeah. And these are all. And my is that the plane officers. you wound up in? That's another strange thing about war. Everybody has the impression that you know you get a plane and you stay with the plane and it's your plane. But um, no, it was. I don't think we had. Uh, we. Th I think we had that plane. We flew it around in the states. But as I will tell you, when we got over to uh, overseas, it was the first thing taken away from us. Uh, I'll put this away now. All right, you're in Casper, Wyoming. Casper, in April Wyoming, forty-four. Uh, and you become part of a crew now, is that correct? We're a crew, and we're training together now. We were. Can you we're, tell us about meeting your crew for the first time? I don't really remember vividly meeting my crew for the first time. I just remember being with my crew. And I would have to also observe in passing as I look back on those days that the officers and the enlisted men were separate, and, uh, which surprised me. Even to this day, I, I know the names when I look at them of the enlisted men on my crew, but we really didn't uh, go places together. It wasn't the thing to do. The officers stayed by themselves. We had our own living quarters. They had their living quarters. I, I thought that was unfortunate, but those, that was the culture of the time, anyway, and of the military, separation of enlisted men and uh, officers. Anyway, I had an excellent pilot named Charlie Noondorf, uh, an excellent co-pilot also. All the crew was, were, were, was an excellent crew. That's why, ultimately, we became a lead crew when we got over into the 8th Air Force and had flown some missions. Um, my co-pilot was later on an all-American football player, and he was a very tall, big guy, six feet three, I think, uh, Ed Washington, from North Carolina. My pilot was from Pennsylvania at that time. Most of the crew people, I think a lot of them were from the South, Georgia and Alabama and around. Uh, also another fellow from Massachusetts. Um, anyway, I, I had one disturbing uh, event while I was at Casper. We used to go out when we had time, I guess, horseback riding out on the prairie outside of Casper. My bombardier was a, a, a gentleman named Salvatore Pipitone, and uh, I had no, no knowledge that he had such strong anti-Semitic feelings. He must have had, because we, had a, a, we were out riding once, and unknown to me, he got up behind my horse and gave it a whack on the rump, and this is all... Um, prairie dog area with holes in the hills and all of that, and you don't, just don't go galloping without, you know, uh, without knowing what you're doing. Anyway, my horse started galloping, and uh, he thought that was funny. I didn't really catch on that this is not just his sense of humor. He didn't say anything, but this, is what, this was an act he did. Later on, there was a further one, but that's further down the road here. Uh, so after Casper, Wyoming, we flew around for a month and uh, we got to be a crew and we did practice bombing with uh, so-called bluebirds dropping just things that were just black powder, I think, that would just make a mark on the ground. Uh, was there a bombing range there at Casper? Or yeah, did you have to have fly been. to get to it? I think we had to fly to get to it, yeah. I also saw a few B-24s crash at uh, Casper, one I remember in flames at the far distant runway. So there were accidents, but that was part of training. Mm -hmm. There was no time practically to lament any of these things. You just went on. Um, I was next assigned. We were assigned to McCook, Nebraska, a town that you, you wouldn't have difficulty finding on the map, but it's a little town in Nebraska. Uh, there was an airfield there. And this was our final phase of training. I don't remember exa exactly what kind of training we did out there. It was about a month long, again the month of May, I'd say. We were at McCook. My mother came out to visit us while we were there. I remember that. My mother was a very peppy, energetic lady, and uh, she made a, a special, uh, special little uh, cinnamon raisin cakes, which were called puttekuchen. I think it's a German word for it. 
And by gosh, if she didn't come all the way by train to see her son Manny out there, because I, we all knew that I, you know, I was going to go somewhere. I wouldn't be around the United States much longer. She came out by train, and in those days, that was a trick, I think, to get to McCook, Nebraska. Anyway, with her little red tin of, uh, of uh, put a cooking for me and my crew. <laughs> and uh, anyway, we, we did our training there. How my did mother you, interacted Excuse a bit. me, but how did your gunners train uh, out there in Nebraska? Did, did anybody uh, tow targets for you? Or? No towing, no. no. No towing of targets. And to be honest with you, I'm, I'm just trying to be conscious of how did they train. Uh, they certainly had some some ground schooling, I guess some further ground schooling, I do not know of what kind. Um, they just said to take care of, I don't know if we had our, our actual 50 calibers assigned to us then, you know, whether the actual guns mm -hmm. were on the, on the plane. I mean, the, um, the holders for the guns were there and all. I couldn't really answer your question as to how they trained gunners then. I don't know how, but they obviously did some shooting while they were there. Mm -hmm. uh, we did mostly bombing practice, I mean, doing that. And I remember flying up and down, north, south, down along the, uh, the Rockies and being very impressed with, uh, boy, they look just like they are on a map here, and that's exactly what they look like. I was always impressed with that as a navigator, of how much the ground looked exactly like it was to look on the map. I mean, you know, the exact uh, image of it. Um, anyway, McCook, Nebraska, and when my mother was there, uh, she did interact with the crew. Um, I remember my mother was also, uh, she stayed at a rooming house. There were no hotels in McCook. She stayed at a rooming house. And I just remember that they had never seen a Jew or met a Jew before, the, the woman that ran the house. And she was expecting somebody with horns. And uh, she met my mother, who was a very nice lady. and you know, No horns. No, no horns. And just, she was shocked. <laughs> uh, anyway, from McCook, Nebraska, we ultimately flew down to Topeka, Kansas. That was in probably very late May, very early June 44, before D-Day, which would be June 6th. It was probably around the 23rd or 4th, 5th of May, something like that. And we were there, that was called a staging area. And um, I don't really know what was being staged, except that was the point from which uh, planes, uh, crews were said, or given orders to fly wherever they were going to go. And ultimately we were given orders, uh, we did some practice flying also there, but we were given orders to uh, go to Grenier Field, Manchester, New Hampshire, was to be our next point. And we happened to leave on June 6th, early in the morning on June 6th, to, to make the flight up to Manchester. And the pilot was listening to commercial radio. I think it was the Cleveland radio station at the time, and uh, that's you, where we first heard the D-Day. The yeah. uh, Allies had landed in Normandy. And he told the crew, and it was a very, very silent crew thereafter. I, uh, Did you feel uh, when you left Topeka that you were on your way overseas? Oh yeah, I mean we were headed in the direction of Europe, I mean yeah. Manchester, New Hampshire. We had a pretty good idea. I don't know that we knew exactly. And um, we got to Manchester, New Hampshire, to Grenier Field, and I actually I, I have written some stories that uh, some of which were back in 1993 when I wrote them some of them have been reprinted in uh, the 8th Air Force Historical Society magazine some in a navigation uh, Association of Flight Observers and Navigators magazine another another group was in second air division magazine and I've brought them along with me because I think they're an excellent place for me to take off from because we're now at the point where my first story originates, flying out of, out of uh, Manchester, New Hampshire. Uh, now this has been published many, Yes, yeah, some correct? of the stories have been, yeah. 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 Okay, would you read a little bit of that yeah, for I'm us? Yeah, I'm going to do exactly that, if you don't mind. Um, all right, fresh from navigation school in Monroe, Louisiana, I joined my permanent and quite excellent crew in April 1944. We were assigned to B-24 Liberators, uh, a four-engine heavy, uh, some of this I think I'll edit as I read, a four-engine heavy bomber more numerous than the B-17 Flying Fortress during the war, but remembered mostly as the flying elephant or the flying boxcar, reflecting its less glamorous silhouette. From Wyoming, we moved on to McCook, Nebraska, and finally to Topeka, Kansas, our so-called staging area. All of this moving about and practice occupied just a bit over two months. 
The gods decreed that we would take off from Topeka for Grenier Field, Manchester, New Hampshire on June 6, 1944, D-Day for some, departure day for us. We left in the early morning. Uh, okay, then about the radio. There followed total silence in the plane, each of the ten of us no doubt considering our near-term future. After a few days at Grenier, we received our orders to proceed to Goose Bay, Labrador. This destination had the ring of huskies, malamutes, and igloos, even though the date was early June. I was issued maps stamped secret for the flight, which, made the, which fact made the war closer and, and more real. The navigator's desk on a B-24 was located in the nose of the plane, the nose wheel and nose wheel doors being just a few feet to the rear of the desk. During takeoffs and landings, all personnel assigned to the nose area during flight had to move back to the rear of the pilot's cockpit. After takeoff, I returned to my desk where I had spread open my secret navigation charts. To my unpleasant surprise, my desk was totally bare. My secret maps had been sucked out the nose wheel door during the takeoff. I pictured them fluttering down into the waiting arms of a Nazi spy in downtown Manchester. I reluctantly snapped on the intercom to advise the pilot of my missing maps. Manny, if you read just a little slower oh, uh, okay. so that we don't miss anything. Well, because of the time I was going too fast. I reluctantly snapped on the intercom to advise the pilot of my missing maps and was surprised by his calm reaction. We turned about, landed, while I revisited the office that originally had issued me the maps. I was equally amazed by the disinterest of the personnel in simply giving me another set of secret maps for the flight, having lost one set to the general people of Manchester. This time I was not so easy a mark and did not lay out my maps on the desk until after takeoff. I remember the feeling of the flight north, the totality of the forests below, passing by Anacostia Island in the St. Lawrence, and thinking that the great adventure had now begun we landed at Goose Bay and were assigned to barracks, double-decker beds for the officers. During the two nights we were there, I recall the strangeness of the sun setting at maybe 10.30 p.m. and rising again at 2.30 a.m. Sleeping in daylight was a new sensation, but not to be compared to green eggs and powdered milk. That was a surprise, my first taste of powdered milk. Oops. I do recall one dramatic incident in my brief adventure in the far north. My pilot co-pilot and I walked off the base a brief distance into the tall fir forest surrounding. I have never forgotten that sound of silence, but for the wind in the tops of the high trees. It was a lack of sound I have always remembered. Then came the morning for our departure, a day I recall without difficulty. We attended our own private briefing because air crews crossed the Atlantic by themselves. No formations or combinations of planes. I, as navigator, had a special briefing on the weather to be expected during the crossing. Special maps for the North Atlantic were given to me, along with a small-scale map for plotting the route I hoped to follow and the actual track we would make on our flight. The size of the plotting map was important. It was about 24 inches in width, encompassing eastern Canada, Greenland, Great Britain, and part of Western Europe. This was perhaps 3,000 miles west to east. This translates to about 125 miles to the inch, a lot of territory for a small distance on the map. As I studied this map, Ireland and Great Britain started to look small to me. Could I miss them completely and fly into Europe, all due to a small navigational error? Uh, we took off early on June 11th, and I remember the sight of a few small icebergs close to shore as we headed out over the ocean. Our initial headings were based on the forecast wind, to be adjusted by my navigational determinations, both visual wind readings by a drift meter from the ocean waves, and later during darkness by a celestial three-star fix. There was one other factor we kept in mind for later in the flight. A German sub had been reported to move about off the Irish coast, transmitting the same radio signal as an Irish station used by incoming Allied aircraft. Its purpose was to cause an aircraft to fly within range of its deck gun and to suffer an early end to its crossing. It had had some success. <clears throat> Darkness came, stable air, and a clear night sky was mine. I had no difficulty standing up with my octant in the overhead blister and taking good shots of three stars whose lines of position would intersect at wide angles. I did my plotting and drew my position lines, and what a beautiful fix it was. I was a good celestial navigator. I flew a few zero-zero celestial missions coming down the main street of Texarkana and environs in my Selman days. Annie, could we go on and uh, get Talk. back to this a little later? Sure, okay.
Yeah. All right. Well, anyway, what I'm going to say here is I didn't really believe my fix totally. I made a half correction. We crossed over neutral Ireland a bit, and um, then uh, we had to fly up around 25 miles into Northern Ireland, where we were supposed to land at a certain air base. There were many air bases there. My pilot got in touch with uh, the tower of the air base we were to land at. He was given landing instructions. We land. Uh, the, he communicates to the tower at the end of the runway. The tower says, we don't see you. So the long and the short was we had landed at a, we were talking to the right tower and landed at the wrong air base, which were very close together there. <coughs> so we had a hop up, land at the correct one, and um, the first thing that happened was a jeep came out to meet us and said, okay, everybody, throw out your B-2 bags. We're taking this airplane. Would you that tell what a B-2 bag is? B-2 bag was just our canvas dun-colored bags that oh, we had all gear. of our possessions, yeah. gears and all yeah. that, and our, and our clothing gear. And um, They were taking your airplane? Is that absolutely. I mean, there was a sh um, they were having some tough times. This was now a, a week after D-Day, a few days, mm -hmm. after, almost a week after D-Day. They needed B-24s to replace other, uh, others that had been shot down or whatever. What did you do then? Okay, well, I mean, we didn't need a plane. We weren't going to go flying anywhere because we were assigned then to a school in Northern Ireland for about another two weeks or so, two or three weeks, I think. I was learning the British G-Box, it was called, which was a device they had invented for navigation, which would give you really exact fixes, but were jammed out by the Germans as soon as you got um, beyond continental Britain, really, uh, right over the channel. But it was very useful for getting a good wind which was important for a navigator. So you're in Northern Ireland without an airplane and going yeah. back to school. And what we did went the back rest to school. of the crew do? Everybody did. They, we all had school. Yeah. The bombardier had school. We're now getting trained into the system that will be used in the 8th Air Force, mm -hmm. I guess, is what we were doing there. Uh, the the uh, gunners had their school and all of that. And I, don't, I thought it was a sort of a pleasant time there, and, and it was intensive learning again, uh, navigation, further navigation. Uh, and saying it took us 10 hours and 55 minutes to fly across the ocean when we uh, did our trip from Goose Bay, Labrador to North Ireland. It takes a lot less than that now. Um, anyway, we were there for a few weeks. Uh, then that got, well, about three weeks, I think, we were at school in, on Loch Ney, which is a beautiful body, a big lake in Northern Ireland uh, to the west of Belfast. And um, then it was time for us to go uh, get on. And what we actually did, I remember, we took our, at least our backpacks. I don't know if we also had our B-4 bags with us for this trek. But we walked from the camp where we were stationed to a uh, port named Larne, L-A-R-N-E, right on the coast of North Ireland, to take a ferry across the Irish Sea down into Stranraer, or Scotland, which is down a fjord on the west coast of Scotland, which was a probably an hour and a half or so of uh, open water ferrying. But anyway, my trip to Larne was we walked. It was about 25 miles, I think. And we walked, and I remember we had an overnight at an RAF uh, barracks. I remember we had straw pillows, and there were mice running in and out of my pillow all night long. I remember was that. this just you uh, or the your whole, crew? The crew and others, probably. And others were probably with you Probably some other crews with us. We, yeah. we walked. Uh, we took the ferry. We came to Stranraer. We were put on a train there. And the train took us down to Stone, England, which is just below Stoke-on-Trent, which is the, uh, the China make manufacturing area of England. And I remember we, when we got there, Stone is right in the Midlands of England, and it's probably about 80 miles or so to, to metropolitan London from there, maybe a little less, even 75. But we could see at night the, gl the red glow of the sky in the southeast from where we were, which would be London, from the bombings and, uh, well, from the bombing that's still going on of London, V-2s and V-1s and, uh, and uh, German aircraft bombing. And we were there, I don't know how long, but not very long, until we were assigned to a bomb group. And we were assigned, my crew was assigned to the 392nd bomb group, which was in East Anglia. Let's see where I am here. You have a map of southern England there? Yes, this is yes. southern England. And, and the this, big brown spot is, is London. East Anglia, that's London. Yeah. And we were just about halfway between Kings Lynn and Norwich, right about here. Our 
uh, bomb group. This is all called Little America, all around in here. Later on, I didn't know it during the war, but it was known as Little America because it was just loaded. It was unbelievably loaded with uh, airfields. I don't think you could go five miles in any direction without being at an airfield. Were any of those fields attacked uh, by, sure, by we the were. Germans while you yeah. were there? Yes, we were. I mean, there were a few times when something would happen like that, either by um, the, uh, the V-1 buzz bombs. They were the first ones, I think. Those were the, uh, looked like a little airplane that they would set off on a chute, mm -hmm. and uh, they were From just all bombs. No, that Pienemund was the V-2s. That was later on. That was the separate uh, stratospheric flying mm -hmm. rockets that would just drop down with no sound, no announcement that, hey, we're coming. The V-1 was just sounding like a, an airplane, but we could recognize the sound of a V-1. It was an air airplane engine that was running it. It was a plane that would just cut out and explode. Now, did they give you folks back a bomber at this time? No, not yet. Uh, in point of fact, we never had a bomber, and um, I don't think the Eighth Air Force in general had bombers, because if something happened to your plane on a mission, it had to be repaired, and you were going to fly another bomber if you were going to fly another mission the next day. So I, don't fe I never felt that we were attached to any given plane later on, as it turns out. We were not. Uh, I'm trying to think if I've left out anything now. We're, so from Stone, we, we were, I think we took a bus ultimately from Stone, England to our bomb base, 392nd Bomb Group in Wendling. And I remember the day when we got there, we drove in through the gates of this field, which were heavily MP guarded. It was a B-24 air base. And uh, I saw a number of foot lockers along the roadway as we drove in. All of us saw that. And we had a feeling what it was, but anyway, <coughs> someone had had the courage to ask somebody stationed on the field, what are all the uh, footlockers out here for? And those were, of course, the crews that uh, had, uh, had lost it, uh, either been shot down or whatever, were missing in action uh, from the prior day's raids. That was, that was our very first entrance into, uh, into, where we, into our bomb group where we were stationed to see that. Uh, you were with the same crew now that you had left. Our crew uh, stays together. And All the way back from the States, and right. so you from were a Casper, great Wyoming unit. to this point, yep. we're together. Okay. We stayed together, all ten of us. And uh, all, four, the, all four offices were assigned to the same Nissen hut <coughs> on, on, uh, at the 392nd Bomb Group, along with, I think, two other crews. I think there were 12, may have been, no, make that eight. Two crews, I think, to a barracks. And I got to be very friendly with the navigator on the other crew. A gentleman named Bill Long, with whom I'm still friendly. There are very few people from my uh, war days, World War II, that I have remained friend, uh, friendly with. One of them is Bill Long. He lives in Sacramento, California, and he had an amazing story. Uh, my pilot, Charlie Nundorf, who lives in California, also I, I am in touch occasionally with him. My co-pilot died about a year and a half ago. And uh, I'm in touch with his wife. Uh, let's see, who else? My bombardier, you know I will never be in touch with. <laughs> we were never friends. This uh, is the man on the horse? Is this that? is the man on the horse. Yes. And this was, uh, might as well finish up with him too, because it's still one of the most puzzling chapters in my remembrance of the war. Uh, we became a lead crew, we were good. And after about four or five missions, they elevated us to becoming a lead, lead crew so that we not only could lead our squadron or our bomb group, but we, we could lead the whole 8th Air Force, as it turned out, on one mission further down in my career. How did we you get to be to. a lead crew? What's involved in that? You just have to be good. And they have to observe that you're a good crew, that you function together well. Um, you have to have a good pilot, first of all. Uh, without a good pilot, somebody that really knows how to fly that plane and tuck those wings in right in with the other wing. Formation flying, that was a, a key element. That was the key to the defense of an Air Force, really, was formation flying. So that when you were taking off as a lead plane, you literally, you, literally yeah, led the yes. way with your desk up in front of the pilot. Yes, yeah, that was you were true further out front than anybody. Yeah. Getting rid of something quickly here, I would say there was one mission that uh, when we went to briefing, you know, we saw where our mission was to go and 
we, they also list the, show a picture of the formations and we were the lead of the high formation and the lead of the group and the lead of the wing, the, uh, that would be four bomb groups, and the lead of the air division, which would be 14 bomb groups, and the lead, our division was to be the lead of the 8th Air Force. In, in other words, the whole, all the 8th Air Force was going to fly behind me, us. And I was in, a, uh, I remember it, uh, when I got that briefing, I was in a state of slight panic, like, is somebody going to help me here? What is this, you know, this, a tremendous responsibility. Could you tell us something the here? The mission was uh, scrubbed. <laughs> were you at that point in the war where they began to use, I think it's called toggle bombing, that everybody bombed on your plane's actions? Exactly true. Would you talk about that a moment, sure. please? Well, uh, the technique of the, eight, the whole 8th Air Force did the same thing. Uh, developed tight formations, first of all. A squadron was to uh, fly very tightly tucked in together. That was for protection for the cone of fire, so-called. So all the, all the uh, machine guns of, that, of those 9 to 12 planes were protecting those 9 to mm -hmm. 12 planes. There would be hardly any place that a, a German aircraft could come in that would not be exposed to a 50 caliber machine gun fire. So a key was the pilot had the pilot said to be very good and fly tight formation flying, and also very level together, so that when bombs were released, the bombs would were, were, were going to be released all together at the same moment. They would have to fall in an excellent pattern, and if one plane was tilted like that or whatever, the bombs are going to fall outside of the pattern. So uh, not only for protection was the tight formation involved, but also for the bombing pattern ultimately, and the way uh, every bomb group. The lead bombardier on the lead plane in each bomb group, all right, bomb group would be made up of four squadrons. A squadron was maybe eight to 12 at maximum bombers. So that a bomb group such as our bomb group would be uh, 32 to um, 48 planes, bombers, flying together. The lead plane, the lead bombardier would be the one who would do the aiming for that bomb group and uh, on the target. And uh, all the other planes had to fly in tight, tucked in position in the formation. And we had, um, it was called a radio intervalometer, which was nothing more than a device after your bomb bay doors are opened. Um, you, you, you set the intervalometer, which was the spacing for the bombs that were to fall, how far apart or how long apart each bomb was to, uh, when it was to drop you know, one second, three seconds, so forth, I would determine that. Um, but when the lead plane dropped its bombs, there was a radio signal instantly that went with his release that hit every other plane in the bomb group and all the bombs went together. So it was a massive, that was the, that was the, uh, that was the, you say, toggle the air or whatever. That was the technique used in the 8th Air Force for bombing. So as so lead called. navigator, you're your job I have was to get crucial, them there, and then the bomb. And your performance was crucial. Yes, yeah. The, um, I have other missions that I wrote about. There was, there was one mission. It was um, I don't remember which one around the fifteenth or so in the middle of our tour of duty, which was 30, 30 missions, where uh, the meteorological prediction, weather prediction, was totally wrong over the continent, and um, it was all foggy, misty and all of the planes kept climbing to try to, uh, to get out into the blue and uh, be able to fly without being in foggy mist. And we got up to absolutely the working altitude of B-24. It couldn't go any higher. It just wasn't responding. Theoretically, a B-24 could go up to about 28,000 feet. It had turbochargers, the same as the B-17s had. But our, our wings were a different kind of wing, and we couldn't lift the load that we were carrying Davis high wing. 17s got all the high 35,000 foot missions because they could, uh, their wing was a different kind of a wing. They were much slower than a B-24. We had speed and a bigger bomb capacity actually, but we couldn't climb to that altitude. Anyway, we were, uh, got as high as we could and there were B-24s lost all over the sky, dropping out of their groups and attaching themselves to behind us. And they were all following me. This was a very harrowing mission because this particular mission, I had told the pilot before we left the ground that my, uh, the G-box was not working but in, in this particular plane. Something was malfunctioning, which meant that I could not get a good wind for navigational purposes, but he still opted that we would fly as lead. That was his decision. 
So I was at a disadvantage. I, uh, I think there were probably 60 or 70 B-24s that started following us, thinking we really knew where we were and what to do, because we got a recall from England when we were out in this uh, bad weather condition. We were over the middle of Germany. We were told to come back. And so it became my job, OK, next I have to give a heading now uh, how to get back to England without flying through flak areas, because uh, we also circled on a map all the known flak positions in, along, the, along our routes. So we knew where we should not fly. You don't want to fly <coughs> over a German flak position. Anyway, I did some hard work, intensive navigation, and we came out over the North Sea, out to, towards the Denmark Peninsula, I would say and everybody came back safely. Uh, that was a particularly harrowing, harrowing time because of my having to estimate some things, uh, such as looking out through my blister above my head and estimating whether I thought those contrails were Messerschmitt contrails or were they P-51 contrails. There's no way to tell the difference, but I had to make some real estimates of what I thought uh, was going on so I could uh, pick my, my directions. Can and I ask you what you thought your greatest challenge in combat was? I guess just, uh, well, a big change I found when I got overseas uh, from training in the States, somebody was always looking over your shoulder, an instructor uh, was always looking over your shoulder in the States to make sure you had almost down to the point of you had sh nice sharp pencils and your compass and you know all, your, your equipment mm -hmm. was all in order. As soon as we got overseas, there wasn't anybody looking. That was the first shock I got before my first mission. Nobody's going to check me here. My God, they're going to let me go off here with, you know, I have to make sure I have my own parachute and my chest pack and all this. Anyway, uh, so you're very self-reliant. You have to be. You have to make sure you have everything. You can't say, oh my gosh, I forgot a critical map or something like that. That was up to you. Uh, your question again was, what was the most challenge, the greatest yes. challenge? Yes, in combat. I guess just to do your job, and uh, I found, you know, just keep on doing my job. There was one mission, I recall, uh, there were German fighters all around, so-called bandits in the area, and there was a, an, a Messerschmitt flying right at, oh, within 50 feet of me, just off our wingtip at an invulnerable position. And um, I had to just keep on navigating. I had no weapon to defend myself with. Uh, uh, he, he later on took off and fired his cannon at my position, which fortunately exploded away from me. I was just lucky on that. You mentioned P-51s a minute ago. This, this suggests that you had uh, patrol, you had fighters escorting you to the targets at this point in the war. We did. They didn't start that way. My, the, the very first missions, I think during the summer of 44, the very first few weeks of them, I don't recall that we had uh, pr fighter protection all the way, but I think by August, uh, mid-August, they had gotten belly tanks and mm -hmm. everything else adapted to the P-51s. We started with P-38s were the predominant uh, plane, the Lightnings, that we had with us as escort. And they would fade out uh, early on over the continent. They didn't have the range. But uh, then P-51s, P-47s, they had belly tanks. They could go all the way to Berlin if we were going there. Um, they were P-51s I love to this day. <laughs> uh, they were a wonderful fighter plane. They were excellent protection. The pilots were crazy, I think, <laughs> talking to some of them, but okay. Can you tell me what was the worst mission you went on and why? I had a few worst missions. Uh, this particular one where I mentioned the Messerschmitt flying off my wing, ME-109, that mission began, we were going to Hanover. I consider Hanover was, Hanover and Brunswick, which were neighboring cities pretty much, were the worst targets I felt in Germany. Actually, one man's uh, meat is another man's potato, as I found out uh, later. Some people say, oh really? You know, they didn't find it that way, but for us it was. And it was going to Hanover, I remember our mission took us right over Bonn, Germany, and I remember looking down, thinking to myself, this is before any fighter appeared on, in, on our horizon, looking down saying, mm, Beethoven's birthplace, Bonn, Germany, right below me here. And we continued on, headed east towards Hanover, and suddenly the pilot, our, my pilot, for some reason, used to love the concept of enemy fighters, bandits in the area. He liked that. He liked the 
challenge. I found it no challenge, but anyway, he liked it. And he announced over the intercom, we have bandits in the area, so everybody alert. And um, for long, this ME-109 appeared right off my wing. I could see his features, really. And he had the traditional white scarf on. I mean, it was a movie, uh, a movie take. Anyway, that was a, a very dangerous mission because the, he wasn't the only fighter. There were others that were attacking us. And um, I think on that mission, I think we were flying deputy lead. The lead plane was uh, had to abandon. It had a couple of engines that had to be feathered. One, one engine was feathered, and another one uh, they just had to stand the prop still. They couldn't feather it. But anyway, he had to abandon the lead and go off by himself and hope he would hope a fighter would escort him back or whatever. So we took over the lead on that mission. Um, it was just a, a great difficulty. At this point in the war, how did you get your news of what was going on in the larger picture? Stars and stripes. That was the only way I knew. I don't, I don't remember that we had a radio that we were listening to particularly. Maybe we did have one in the barracks. Uh, I have a vague memory of listening to the uh, our, our kind of music, but on a German radio station. Vague. I don't remember it vividly. Um, anyway, Stars and Stripes that we got very regularly and had all the news mm -hmm. that we were likely to have. And we also had a uh, group bulletin board where any special news would be put up. I remember going to London on leave. We would go to the Target Zero. I mean, that always struck me as strange, you know. Why don't we go somewhere else? But everybody would go, all the air crews would go to London where the V1s and the V2s were dropping, and uh, if there was danger on the, on the land, they were there. Uh, but we had good times in London. I remember staying at the Junior Officers Club on South Audley Street, which I've since tried to find, but I haven't. It was some great somebody's mansion. Did you have any... Uh were you in contact with other people you might have trained with or any friends, and did you keep in touch with them? I know. I, I meant to finish that story about the, the, uh, my friend Bill Long and his lead crew that was shot, uh, that had to abandon uh, the mission to Hanover that day. Mm -hmm. Their story, briefly, was uh, after they abandoned the mission, they did manage to keep flying. They were losing altitude on two engines, but still managed to keep going until they got out to the channel again, and one of the waste gunners, that, the waste was the positions toward the tail where there were guns on either side. Anyway, With the big open window. They threw out a window, yeah. and the window hung up on the horizontal stabilizer of the tail, causing too much uh, wind resistance. They could not dislodge it. The pilot did everything he could, change, you know, swerving, changing, uh, making turns to get that window to fall away. It was just creating tremendous wind resistance, forced them to ditch in the channel. And I remember the, the, the co-pilot, uh, Jim Whalen, did an amazing thing. He was wearing his flak helmet, which we wore in combat. Overhead in the co-pilot, over the co-pilot and pilot seat would be maybe quarter-inch steel plate. He went up through the steel plate. He had to get out of the plane after it ditched. And, uh, you know, he didn't think about, how can I go through steel? He went through steel. An amazing bit of uh, physical exertion. And my friend Bill, uh, they lost, I think, two people on their crew when they ditched, who drowned, went down with the, the airplane. And he ended up um, in, in a psychiatric unit for a while after he got out of that one for a few weeks being taken care of. But anyway, he and I are still in touch today. He's a great guy. He's in Sacramento. I take it they were picked up. They were picked up by Air Sea Rescue, mm -hmm. who every 15 miles, I think they had uh, already strung out, the British had already strung out their rescue vessels waiting. So it was not too bad. It took them several minutes to get picked up. How many missions did you fly? 30. 30. And then right. what happened to you? Ah. Uh, uh, then I, uh, let me see, that was the December 28th was my last mission. I would mention that was the only time I've ever smelt exploding gunpowder, and that was enough for me, I mean, from the flak shells. And let me read something here a second. Um, metals are commendations. The air metal with four oak leaf clusters, distinguished flying cross, European theater ribbon with four battle stars, these right. are hard-won uh, medals. 
Not everybody came home with this. Some of them are automatic. But, uh, but I, the uh, four-leaf clusters. Uh, every six missions, I think, we would start with an air medal, then the next one would be a cluster, after six more, and after six more, and after six more. You got, that was, that, those would be pretty automatic. Any crew that finished mm -hmm. uh, six mission units would get a cluster for their But Nokia you came cluster. home a decorated veteran the Distinguished of the Flying wars. Cross was not automatic, not totally so. No. That was, can you tell us about subjective. it? It was not that. for anything specific. I think uh, everybody on my crew got a Distinguished Flying Cross, I think, because we did, I hope, Distinguished Flying <laughs> for the 8th Evidently. Mm -hmm. If you look back on your total experience there, can you say what, you, what your most memorable experience of the entire war was? I had one more incident with my bombardier. I hate to be bringing these things up when I'm sitting here talking about uh, my war, my World War II war, but I mean, it was so stunning that he picked a, he suddenly attacked me before a mission. We were out at the plane, ready to, waiting for a flare as a signal to uh, get, in, get into the plane, get to our positions, and before we start engines. He suddenly attacked me with vicious kinds of statements. Uh, my pilot and co-pilot had to pull him off of me again. Uh, stunning. I don't, I don't know what was in the man's mind. I mean, here we are about to fly together. We have to do something together. We're dependent upon each other. And he's attacking me. Anyway, I haven't seen him since. So, I mean, when you ask me for the most significant uh, thing, I think of these things, I wonder how could that have been? How could, what was in his mind? What kind of a person can that be that would do it's it? It's ironic considering what you were... We were fighting exactly What that. you were fighting against exactly over that. there, isn't it? After all this, can I ask you the question, was there any a good humorous experience? Oh, many. I had my, my humorous experiences, yes. Um, there was the mission, which I've written about here, but I won't uh, read any, take too long. Uh, following D-Day, I think it was um, the, first San, the first mission to St. Lowe, I think, where December t uh, July 28th, 1944. Uh, the Germans uh, were very much entrenched around St. Lowe, and the Allies' troops were trying to break through and go south, but it was very stubborn and difficult. So uh, the mission that was planned for the 8th Air Force was to saturate bomb several square miles of uh, the St. Lowe terrain. Saturate bomb it, and I mean horribly. Uh, to get the Germans, finish them off, get them out, or whatever. Anyway, so we, it was a fairly low level mission for, for heavy bombers, it was 12,000 feet, I think, which was low. We usually bombed at 22,000 or so. Our plane got over there, and we, uh, bomb release, the bombs hung up in our bomb bay and did not release. So we closed our bomb bay doors. Uh, and started, took our headings back, you know, to go back to England with, in, in our group, of course. And um, all of the equipment was right near the navigator's table in the nose of the plane. The bombardier had already left. He was back and further back in the plane. And after we left and the bombs didn't go, I couldn't understand what happened to the bombs. Why didn't they go? They were still on the shackles, they but... Still on safety. Okay. We, had re we wired them. So I kept jiggling around, fooling around unknown to anybody. I was just curious, what's the matter here? And whomp, suddenly the plane lifts like that. Out go the bomb bay doors, and all the bombs go with them, of course. The bombs released. Right through the doors? Oh, yeah. The door is just aluminum sheet. They, they went easily that, out. That puts a draft in the plane, The pilot it? said, what the hell? What's <laughs> happening? You know, what's going on here? A sudden release of uh, eight, uh, seven or 8,000 pounds out of the plane like that. And um, I was very innocent about it. I said, Chad, I don't know what happened. You know, what happened? What did, you know, I was as innocent as anybody, but I knew what had happened. They were on safety when they did. They dropped. were on safety, and I watched them go down, too. I panicked as soon as I felt this happen, and I looked out. I had one little window you could almost stick your nose into and see down a little bit. And there were ships. We were down out off the Normandy coast, and there were Allied shipping and whatnot. And I saw them all go splashing right near a ship, but not onto anything. But they didn't explode. They were safety. I would not go swimming off the Normandy, <laughs> off Normandy beaches at all. But I mean, you know, it's sort of funny. I uh, later on, many years later, <laughs> when I wrote these stories, I guess it was the first time my pilot and co-pilot, you know, before they knew anything, what had happened on that one. There was some. There was one other 
strange one too. Electric heated suits, very stiff suits. It's mm -hmm. another one that I wrote about here. We had a long mission to um, outside of Munich. That was our longest one, I think. And um, it was very hard to see your watch. Navigators had to see the watch. I mean, you had to be able to tell your times and put down times in your log as to what, what happened when and changes of headings. So I looked around, I see nice hydraulic lines, very thin lines up in the nose section above my desk in the nose of the plane. I said, ah, what I can do is I could take off this darn watch and I could belt it right around one of those struts and I'm in business. I won't have to keep pushing back this stiff electric suit and gloves and all of that to see what time it was. A word of uh, condition there. If it was 40 degrees below zero centigrade outside the plane, it was 40 degrees below zero, zero centigrade in the plane because we were not heated environments in these planes. These, that's why you wore an electric heated suit in order to stay warm and be able to function. Anyway, so I hung up my watch. I thought it was a great navigational advance there without reckoning that what, cold, what <laughs> minus 40 will do to a wristwatch, a mechanical wristwatch. So, I mean, I, I navigated myself right off the charts because the, the real, um, the apparent time was so much faster, the watch was galloping. And I finally had to tell the pilot, we're off my charts, I don't know what's going on here, but we're, you know, we're going to end up in Tibet the way things are going, before I caught on to the fact that my time is Your right. watch got a little cold, oh, didn't it? it was yeah. frozen. Nothing happened because of that, but I mean, <laughs> that's funny. After the number of missions, did you come home then? Or we went uh, to a, outside of Liverpool, it was a, a small a, 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 a base call, a town called Chorley, C-H-O-R-L-E-Y, and we were, I was assigned to go there. This was after, um, after December 28th, I, maybe it was January, early January 45. I went there, and this was one of those strange things again of meeting my friend Stan Russell from summer camp, then from Selman Field, Monroe, Louisiana. Yeah, Stan again. And here he is fresh from navigation. He was in the so-called Bloody 100th Bomb Group. Uh, that was a B-17 group that got a nickname for good reason, probably. Anyway, he was done with his tour, so he and I were together for four or five days. I remember going into Liverpool. We walked into Liverpool, which on the map seems like several, more than several miles from Chorley, but anyway, we went in and we heard a concert in, in a school gymnasium by uh, Sir John Barbaroli and the Holly Orchestra. It was a pleasant memory. Very nice. Walk back, yeah. And I ended up going back by ship convoy. I went. I was ordered down to Southampton. Got on a ship down in Southampton Harbor. During the night, German subs or a German sub was sh uh, torpedoing ships in the harbor. It was somehow got into the harbor. I, we saw two of them, I think, go down. And anyway, uh, the convoy finally uh, left Southampton. It was quite a big convoy. I remember behind us in the convoy going, and we had very luxurious quarters, I have to say, on the ship, the offices did, going back to uh, the States, and the food was good, and uh, they kept giving warnings on uh, the ship's uh, radio. Uh, anybody caught with a, a diary of combat was subject to five years in Leavenworth. I fell for that. I mean, I don't know how true that was, but I had a wonderful diary that I tore into little pieces to, uh, set on fire and flushed down the toilet in my quarters there because of the panic. Other guys kept their diaries. They became books and interesting resources for information, but not mine. Uh, there was a German prisoner warship behind us, and I remember a prisoner jumped off in the middle of the ocean. It was lost, I mean, yeah, believing that uh, you know, it was going to be terrible for yes. him when he got to the States. Where did you land here in the States? <laughs> Boston. In Boston. <laughs> Came right into Boston, then I went down to the, the Cape to Otis, I think, uh, briefly, I don't remember how long, and then came home on leave, came home to discover my father had had a stroke several months earlier and was not in good condition. And after that, uh, then I was assigned down to um, Ellington Field, Houston, Texas, to be retrained for the Pacific, <laughs> and um, I became the base information and education officer while I was down there. That was, this was when? This would be? The spring of 45. Yeah, 45, late spring. Well, one thing that happened while I was there, I was assigned also to the 8th War Loan Drive, 7th War Loan Drive, watch that, 7th War Loan. 
uh, and I was assigned to be a speaker back in the Boston area, which was a very nice thing to have, have happened to get back home again. So I came back home. I remember speaking at uh, theaters around Boston, going up to Gloucester to speak at that theater. I remember having a, an Air Force band behind me who, when Lieutenant Abrams was introduced, Lieutenant Abrams picture. And this may have been from that, that time. That was Lieutenant Abrams. When I, uh, when I uh, was introduced and I'd come out on stage and uh, the Air Force band would be playing da 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 And I remember <laughs> then after a few times of this happening, I started feeling embarrassed when I'd come out to speak because I didn't want to say the same thing of, of my memorized speech from uh, two days before or whatever when the same Air Force band was sitting behind me on the stage. So I remember getting into trouble on ad-libbing once at least, you know. But anyway, it was a good experience to have. Did you feel that uh, your reception coming home was good vis-a-vis -vis, um, what has happened to men that might have served in other wars? Were you well we received? Were very well, yeah. We were, we were heroes <laughs> coming home. Yes. That was the climate. How important was serving in the military to you? I think it was very important. Oh, I, uh, I don't know how I could have gotten through that period of my life and of the times we were in and not have served. I mean, all my friends were serving. I wanted to serve. Actually, a very important thing was Franklin D. Roosevelt to me. Um, he, he was the cause of, of, of why I would fly. I remember saying to myself before some horrible mission or during some hor uh, horrible moment in the mission, I'm doing this for Roosevelt. And that was a motivation for me, doing it for yeah. the president when something terrible was all about me <laughs> to keep me going. If there's one thought or one memory you would share with us or with your family, what would that be, Manny? One. What, what kind of a thought would you like me to, to share if I have Something one? somebody 50 years from now would oh. look at and think mm -hmm. about. Well, I suppose it will always be necessary for us to have a strong military capability Although after all these centuries, I mean, it really wears me down to look back and think of the centuries of mankind, of humankind, and that they still are no, still doing the same dumb things, they still can't live together. And my own personal views, I think that um, organized religion is no help at all to this. I mean, I look around and the scene I see is almost any, any war that's going on or that has gone on in the past, religious uh, beginnings to it, a religious continuation to it, caused by it in North Ireland, certainly today, and many other places. And that to me is sad. <laughs> um, this is not a very great thought I'm giving for anybody 50 years from now. But I hope that by 50 years, I doubt it, but I wish that they could get over the needs for having combat, military combat, as the way to settle issues between peoples. Annie, we want to thank you very much for being with us today. We appreciate it and hope that, uh, I hope that sometime people look at this and understand they've met a very distinguished person. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, John.